I'm pretty sure that I've talked about Jerome more than anybody else Absolutely. on the planet, <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. including the people in the band. <laughs> that stuff, especially like Decimate the Weak and the Great Stone War, if those came out today, I feel like they'd be more popular than they were at the time. They're very ahead of the curve. Remember those like YouTube breakdown compilations? Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> top, top, top 10, ten. bone crushing yeah. <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> breakdowns you yeah. will ever hear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Tracheotomy is my favorite of them, and they look yeah. like they're like 17 or something yeah. like that. <laughs> I mean, I think Joey is one of the most important people in the history of metal. I mean, he yeah. totally changed the way that metal sounds, especially metalcore, because before that, metalcore sounded shitty. Real quick before we start, I just wanted to mention that we do these podcast recordings live on stream. We stream every single Wednesday at 6 p.m. EST on Twitch. It's an opportunity for you guys to come hang out, interact, and ask your questions directly to all of our guests. We also have a Discord if you want to keep talking more about Deathcore and Metalcore or simply to keep up with everything that we're doing, upcoming guests, and all that jazz. I'll leave links to both of these things in the description wherever you are watching or listening. And with that out of the way, please enjoy this episode. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Brutality Podcast. My name is Dom. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Yan. How are you doing, Yan? I'm doing super well because Finn is here, so of course I'm doing well. That's it, that's it. And as you said, we are welcomed this week by none other than Finn McKenty. Finn, welcome to uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm excited. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you for so much for for taking the time and for doing this. Uh, you know, I'm sure I'm sure Yan has, has told you personally, but we're both uh, we're both big fans of of what you do and the channel and the podcast and all the other things that you do. So excited to uh, excited to hop in. Well, I appreciate it. A big fan, Yan. I told you this as well. Big fan of what you do. I think you're there's nobody else doing uh, what you're doing right now, and uh, I appreciate it. It's cool. Thank you so much. I mean, I couldn't even, you should have seen my face when you first commented. Like at first I thought it was like a fake account or something. I'm like, oh, okay, no, it's probably just someone like that. And I'm like, that's actually you legit. You me on Telegram to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I have a program for you and I'm like, I'm, I'm screwed. But no, I was like super happy and um, it really, you never know, right? Like just a small comment and then we, we started talking and stuff like that. Like it really... It gets you going, especially in the beginning on, on, on YouTube, you know, you start, you have 20 views and then you're like, yep. nobody cares about what I'm doing at all. So it's, it's awesome. It's really, it's really appreciated. And, and I've been very open, like to everybody. I'm like, yeah, it's a big inspiration. Like some people were printing out, oh, it's, it's kind of like what Finn's doing. I'm like, I mean, I, I was inspired by what he's doing. Yeah, for sure. look, I mean, we all, you know, we all take inspiration from other people. I think my channel is just a rip off of people like Patrick H. Willems and Psych IRL, you know, but whatever. If people like it, they like it. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason not to be like if you're inspired and you feel like you can, you know, do your own thing on certain things. And I've seen the whole MySpace, like, you know, Ben's like Jerome and stuff like that. I'm like, that needs to be documented. Like people need yeah. to talk about these amazing Ben in that era. So I started doing it and people are, you know, seem to be loving it. So why not? Right. So yeah, but, but 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 I was very stoked. Like when you said that, I was like, I just can't believe it. And uh, it's 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 a, like and even the advice you would give give me off street, like it would help a lot. I wanted to start a second channel and I'm so glad I didn't, to be honest with good, you. Good, good. I'm glad. Yeah, like so happy I didn't. <laughs> it was a big thing and everything was ready. And then you told me that I'm like, oh, really? And then I started talking and I ended up not doing it. And I'm as I said, I'm like very happy with my decision so it's it's Cause if, if if i tell him he's not good he's not gonna take my word for it but if finn says it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you've been telling me the, the same thing before to be fair to be you fair. never listen when mom tells you you only listen when dad says it <laughs> yeah. yeah there you go exactly and and before getting started i just wanted to say finn i've watched your video that you kind of retrospect and you talk about before like the, the mistakes you you did and stuff like that and, and stuff if you wanted to know it was like super interesting i love this kind of video that you know it's very humble it's like hey 
I was like that. I was thinking like that. And I've learned like I, I love this kind of this kind of stuff. I just Thanks. Wanted... It doesn't get a lot of views usually, but, you know, I like to do it sometimes. Yeah, it's OK. It's it's for people like me who's like, oh, I, I love it. And, and then the rest of the yeah. people are like, where's the drama? Where's the. <laughs> yeah, where's... Why aren't you talking about Fred Durst? Yeah. yeah why, why aren't you talking about Nick Knox's bad takes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't do that. I think he has great takes. I've never said he had a bad take. No, but like pe people. No, no, the, th the thumbnails say otherwise, I guess. Well, you got to do what you got to do. But mm, exactly, uh, exactly. no, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Nick. I, of I think course, he's of awesome. I too. No, he's awesome. But like, it's it's just how it works, right? Like you need to grab like it's it's really how it works. Like yep. most of people I'm watching, it's the same thing. I love people like Asmongol and whatever, like streamers and their title are super clickbait and they know it and they're like, that that's how it works. So why not? Gotta do what you gotta do. I mean, if it works, mm -hmm. just just do it. So, yeah. I, uh, I, I guess I, I wanted to kind of set this up because um, you know, you, you, you do a lot of stuff with, uh, with music and stuff, but you know, Yan, Yan and I, for context for this podcast, uh, specifically, I guess we met through our shared love for, um, MySpace deathcore particularly. Right. And I think it would have been easy for both of us. You know, we, we both, you know, content creation is our thing if, if you will, but it'd be easy to dive into YouTube analytics and, and talk about short form and all this stuff. But, uh, I think it would be rather interesting to have you, uh, kind of talk on, uh, deathcore and MySpace deathcore. Cause I know, you know, throughout the years, everything, everything I've, I've, uh, I've seen you do, uh, even when it came to the early blogs and all this stuff, you've been kind of shouting certain really obscure deathcore bands from, uh, from the top of rooftops. I'm pretty sure stuff, that I've so. talked about Jerome more than anybody else Absolutely. on the planet, yeah, <laughs> probably yeah, yeah. including the people in the band. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, I thought, I thought it'd be great. Like we were talking about, you know, having you on and uh, I know, you know, you and Yan have a relationship from, from both doing YouTube and stuff, but I thought it'd be, it'd be cool to have uh, a conversation about deathcore and, and just, just for starters, I think, um, we got to show the people, here i mean people seem to really enjoy uh the ricky hoover look on uh on, on yourself uh any any uh any chance we get some some big plugs on you in the near future only if i can also build a time machine and join chelsea grin in 2019 or uh, 2008 perfect there we go there we go perfect <laughs> we maybe we can make that who knows in the future we're going to invent so work we need to remember that in case we have a time machine I want Never to see know. That. How uh, how about we start with kind of I guess getting into deathcore? I'd be super curious because you talk about these bands and stuff every now and then. And I mean, as far as far back, like I said, as like the blogs and all this stuff. But I'd love for you to maybe which talk blogs to are you talking about? Like the old I mean, ones from like two thousand eight. Yeah, Metal Inquisition yeah, okay, and, and okay, stuff you yeah. will hate and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. And even when you were wrote for Metal Sucks, like it was yeah, okay. So you, so you know all of it, yeah. Absolutely, and I okay. mean I've seen I've seen you talk about Jerome and Demolisher on all of these avenues. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, so uh, but I just love to to hear it from you. I guess bring us back to like 2006. Like is Finn McKenty on MySpace? Like how how do you discover yeah, Deathcore? What are the first bands you you maybe heard of? Did you did you immediately like it? Like I'd love to hear that sort of story from you yeah probably 2005 or six or whatever um I, I mean i'm pretty sure depending on how you want to define it but i'm pretty sure the first you know deathcore band as we would think of it that i heard was probably job for a cowboy and i and i'd already been listening to death metal you know i started listening to death metal in like 1991 or something like that so by the time i heard you know deathcore i'd been listening to this kind of stuff for a long time so you know it wasn't like i was new to extreme music or something but uh <clears throat> yeah i think i heard job for a cowboy or something it was probably them. And, you know, they just had a very like fresh take on it where it was like obviously death metal inspired, but it wasn't death metal. And, you know, the, the main thing that sort of stood out to me was just how different the fan base was because, you know, the scene kids and stuff were just so completely different from like death metal fans that that was the part that was really interesting to me. Not just the sound. The sound was different because, you know, I had breakdowns and stuff and that was cool. But I was just fascinated by it being just a totally separate culture from metal. And in particular, I always thought it was very interesting that, you know, it takes Suicide Silence, which especially that early stuff was like not so different from like brutal death metal. And it people was very interesting. People were so hell bent on not calling it metal, right? Right. And I was like, do you have functioning ears? Like, if this isn't death, <laughs> if this isn't metal, like, 
what is it? Like, I don't know, you know, it, it, that, that was the part that was interesting to me, but the, you know, the scene kids that were into that stuff were not metal kids, you know, like some of them of course grew up to become metal kids, which I would say is like the low point of death core to me was maybe like 2014 to 2018, like Reddit era death core to me, it was just like the low point of it. Um, where a lot of those people just turned into like, you know, death metal nerds. Um, but yeah, that just that it, <clears throat> it had this whole like parallel culture of all these like MySpace scene kids that didn't know or care at all about quote unquote real metal, but loved all this like really extreme. I mean, a lot of that deathcore stuff was more extreme than you know anything other than death metal, and it's all these like fourteen year olds and stuff on MySpace listening to the craziest, most extreme shit. And uh, I just thought that was a really fascinating kind of example of culture. It was, it was kind of, yeah, I guess for me, I fall in that camp, I guess, like of, you know, I was listening to emo and stuff like that before, before getting into deathcore. Right. So to your point, like there was no other, that was the heaviest and craziest thing that I had ever heard. But even, even with that perspective, it was still, it would still be weird to be like, well, this isn't metal or it's like this other thing or, or. You know, I, the, the comparisons I always thought were were weird. I think a lot of that maybe stemmed also when, when some of these deathcore bands eventually like turned into death metal, right? You saw Job for a yep. Cowboy turn more death metal and that that I feel like created Chapel, even more division, mm-hmm. you know, like and, and they yeah. were in a weird spot where it's like, well, they were a deathcore band, but they're not deathcore anymore. And the death metal bands, the death metal fans don't like Job for a Cowboy in their death metal form because they right. think they're still <laughs> deathcore. <laughs> it's yeah. such a wild, a wild time. But you, I mean, you weren't a scene kid yourself, right? So you no. were just kind of observing that from the outside and thinking it was cool. Because I think it'd be fair to say that most metalheads didn't think the scene kids were were cool, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is not who I am. I'm not one to, like, if people are excited about something, I want to understand it. Even if I don't like it, I'm like, the thing I currently don't really understand, and maybe that maybe I've finally just gotten old and I don't get it, is like, I don't understand the appeal of Yeet at all. Um, I mean, I guess I sort of do a little bit. Like, he has a cool image and stuff like that, but, like, I don't understand the appeal of his music at all or Playboy Cardi, like any like rage music. I don't understand. I think it I, I it just doesn't sound like good music to me. Um, but, you know, I'm never going to be the person, you know, obviously there's millions of people that love it. So millions of kids that love it. So there's something there. I, I think obviously I don't get it. Um, and so that's sort of my reaction to anything like that. And, you know, all that deathcore stuff was so popular on MySpace at the time that there was obviously something there and I wanted to understand it. Were you working in music at that point already? Like, was that or just I've never like worked music, in music other than just like URM you know, and well, yeah, but I mean, you, you did a, a lot of stuff like adjacent I mean, to like, production and stuff like that. Yeah, but I've never like wor- I don't consider myself as like working in the music industry. But at that time, I had nothing to do with it other mm. than just like blogging. Well, in two th- no, well, 2005, actually, I worked for a magazine called uh, Flow Multizine. Which, if anybody remembers, we did. Uh, it was an interesting format. We did a CD. That it came with a CD, a DVD, and a magazine. This is obviously, you know, we I did this from 2004 to 2007, I think. Um, and we did, I think, 12 or 15 issues and like 125,000 copies of each. Which, for an independent magazine at that time, was a lot. Huge, and yeah. so labels labels would pay us to put their uh, their songs on the CD or the videos on the DVD. And we worked with everybody like. Every label, you know, Century Media, Nuclear Blast, and Solid State, and I mean, Victory, like everybody. So I suppose in that sense, I was involved, you know. And so, like, I did, I remember we did like an under oath interview when like their only chasing safety came out. We had, you know, lots, yeah, I mean, we had tons of shit on there. Um, so I was exposed, I, I was, I was, I suppose, adjacent to the music industry at that time. I would I would be curious to know which if you remember like which death core show maybe you saw first or like your first live experience maybe and during that era if, if you remember I'd be curious to know. Um I it, it would have been some random I mean this is I lived in Cincinnati then and you know I, I maybe I saw some like random show or something at that time but i didn't really go to that i mean there weren't really like that many deathcore shows at least not where i lived so like probably i saw suicide silence or something when it's one of the winds of plague or something one of those big bands when they were like touring but um there wasn't really like 
it, it's not like hardcore where at least where where I lived at the time where there was like a, a big like local scene or a lot of bands playing shows. It was more of like an internet thing in my experience. But again, I was older, so maybe it's different for, you know, teenagers. It does make sense though, because like I I think it's fair to say like we call it MySpace Deathcore for a reason. Like it was like mostly like the big hype was the, it was the beginning of social media. I don't know if we mm -hmm. can call it social media, but it was still the beginning of it. And um, the, the beauty we were talking about the the hate right from the that metal scene and stuff like that. I feel like it was a big part of the success of it. Like the it, kids were proving them wrong. Like there was a yep. scene building up. So even if people were saying, oh, it's not metal or the, like, I don't know if you remember also the album reviews are, they would like trash dead core. They would say like, it's horrible. Yep. It's terrible. It's gimmicky and stuff like that. Or but, just not talked about, right? Even though they were yeah. the biggest albums in yeah. the genre, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Just being ignored and, and, but, but, Kids were buying it. They were there for it. There was clearly a scene. I do remember in 2007, 2008, you, you would walk to, to a show and you would see people with <laughs> stretch ears and all this. Yeah. Like it was pretty clear that, that, that it was there, but it was, yeah, it was a big internet thing. But um, yeah, I was, I was curious to know if it was more like online or if it was like a band who gave you that kind of feeling. No, first. It, was, it was something on, it was definitely like definitely my space that I saw it. Um, Cause I would always just like click around on my space and try to find stuff. And uh, also another, another thing I found a lot of bands from back then, you remember those like YouTube breakdown compilations? Oh my yeah. God. You yeah. Know, <laughs> top, top, top 10, 10. Most bone crushing. Yeah. <laughs> ridiculous breakdowns you yeah. will ever hear. Yeah, exactly. It's almost Mr. Beastie. Uh, to, to yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I still remember like, I, like I'm pretty sure that's how I found Demolisher. Definitely how I discovered Recon and Abacab and a lot of those kind of random obscure bands. <laughs> Yeah, like that's something that really clicked. Like uh, I said earlier that you were an inspiration for your channel. Obviously, one of my first videos, what it was probably a death card thing you did, but I was very amazed by the fact you would know these things like Jerome and Suffocate. Like Suffocate is still one of my favorite. Like I'm still listening oh, to great. it. Yeah. They're awesome. And um I kind of assume that you loved hardcore because the your favorite deathcore band has a big hardcore influence yeah. in it. So I, I kept telling them, I'm like, I'm I'm he's probably more like he wasn't the hardcore scene, I would guess, you know, but you yeah, you know yeah, it makes sense. But like do you remember how it was perceived by the hardcore scene, like the deathcore thing? No, the, everybody thought it was gay. I oh, mean, okay, that's what I. Yeah, that's I what mean, I thought. <laughs> everybody that wasn't a scene kid thought deathcore was fake and gay. I mean, that's all there. Nobody had any respect for it whatsoever anywhere. That's kind of what I I figure, especially like hardcore. There's this. But I wouldn't say like violence, but like, you know, you go. Oh, it's violent. Yeah. You yeah. went to the show like it was like a tough guy thing. So yeah. you see people wearing skinny jeans and like little little hair like this, like yelling in the mic for sure. You're like, no, you're, you know, get up. But I, yeah, I mean, especially where I lived at the time, it was very violent. And yeah, I yeah, the, the it was not welcome and hardcore at all. Yeah, I think people were surprised by the emo kids doing extreme music, I guess. Like, it, it, that's kind of what it was, if we're being honest here. Like, mm -hmm. deathcore and metalcore and all these things, like, it was coming from the emo screamo scene and they just went in metal. So, maybe. Little 120 pound kids with skinny girl jeans and yeah. swoopy hair playing the most brutal shit you've ever heard in your life. Yeah. So, that's weird. Yeah. That's hard to welcome, I guess. For I mean, not to me, but I've never been the yeah. type to reject new things. Yeah. But that's me. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't, I couldn't figure out if this was exactly uh, you or someone else on Metal Inquisitions, but, uh, but I, I, I thought this was hilarious. This is this quote here. Only fatties, shut ins, and pedos listen to Brain Drill. Awesome dudes like us, <laughs> Mosh Bros, just want to put on some Air Max 90s, mosh our balls off to some X Breakdowns X, and bands like Suffocate, Recon, and Life Ruiner are more I have than no happy idea. to oblige. <laughs> there was a lot of people that wrote. <laughs> 
for yeah. that blog, and I don't remember if that was me or not. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's sad. <laughs> it, it was. It was in an article that was uh, about Demolisher, Jerome, Abacab, and all these bands. So Probably I, me. Then, I, 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 I figured. It goes yeah. on to say, I'm pretty stoked that it's. I do like, but I like Brain Drill. I don't know why I said that because I like Brain Drill. <laughs> yeah. As, as I'm pretty stoked that it's 2009 and there's still bands who just want to see people hardcore two step and have a good time, not make the cover of Guitar Jizz magazine. Wow. That doesn't sound like something I would have said, but maybe who knows? Mm, who knows? Who knows? Younger <laughs> Finn, maybe. Yeah. It's a bit more. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? No. Yeah, but ba- back then, you know, there's like a big thing I think with with deathcore. And if you like, obviously, you guys remember Smosh and all these things. Like I said, my friends on fire and stuff like that. I think like humor and laughing at ourselves yeah. was also a big part of it. So like, I'm not I'm not surprised. Like I think. Even like I'm gonna I'm gonna talk for myself, but like I knew how it was perceived. Like I was the kid wearing skinny jeans and stuff like that. Like I I loved that metal, but I wasn't that surprised that they would be like, "What is that?" Because prior to that, emos were not super accepted as well. So like it's just right. kind of the continuity of it, I guess. So okay, so what is this controversial opinion? <laughs> Musical innovation died with MySpace with the uh, wow. sad emoji at the end. And then obviously, I just, you know, Jerome yeah. is right here. But uh, t- talk to us about the death of... What is of, this from? Uh, uh, 2015. October. I mean, I don't remember this at all. I wrote this 10 years ago, so I have <laughs> no, no clue. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking for you to, to speak on this article, <laughs> yeah. but I, th- I thought the statement was still something worth worth maybe talking about. Like, is, is that something you would still think is true musical innovation died with myspace i think there's a compelling argument here personally if you ask me uh no because i would say soundcloud kind of carried the torch after that and in 2015 maybe that was the very that was still pretty i mean soundcloud was the thing i don't know uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't remember writing that so i don't remember what my argument was there um i was probably I, I don't remember what point I was trying to make, but I will say MySpace was definitely a place with a ton of experimentation and stuff that I, I don't. That was that was the gist of it. Uh, ultimately, yeah. is kind of kind of the fact that you know it eventually deathcore became more and more stale, and and whether yeah. that's to attribute with MySpace, yeah. the demise of MySpace or not, I think ultimately those things seem to be tied in, in some sense. I think there's something to be said about maybe you know. Deathcore was just so new at the beginning. So everyone was just, you know, it was a melting pot of a bunch of these different influences and it eventually became just narrower in terms of like people copying the biggest bands type thing, which you couldn't really yep. do in the beginning because everyone was sounded so different, nothing to copy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. And the kids were so young that they just didn't know or care at all right. about sort of what you're supposed to do. Like, for example, this, yeah, I mean, this is obviously not Deathcore, but like if you talk to, you know, Johnny or Caleb from Attack Attack and ask him why they did stuff. They're like, I don't fucking know. Yeah. Like, cause I was 15. <laughs> I just did random shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why were you wearing this? They're like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's, I was in ninth grade. I didn't think about it, but it, it's a conversation we have very often because from my perspective, you know, around like what, 2011, 2012, we see the end of my space. Then Mitch Locker, unfortunately, passed yeah. away so like i feel like these two things together really felt like that core was yeah. literally dying like that's at least yeah. that's how i felt like ricky hoover was out of suffocate like in my world that core was just die like i think, I, I, I think those two people specifically hit on another point I, i'm remembering now from the article as well which was like kind of you know you had these very charismatic front men uh, that, that were fronting these bands and all of a sudden they, there weren't really any of those in the scene anymore. Like there there's Ollie, but they, you know, were but they no weren't longer, doing, yeah, yeah, they weren't doing deathcore anymore. Right. So it was just kind of one of those things. Like no one was there to carry the torch and in that respect, yep. still bands were still doing it, but there was no like superstar fronting a band anymore. Yeah, yep. uh, and yeah. that was the Reddit era of deathcore where it was just boring, boring, boring yes. in my opinion. And, and I feel like, I think it would be fair to say that you need people carrying, like you need icons in a scene to like keep it alive. Like if you don't have these guys, like it just doesn't, like you need someone to look up to. Like when Ollie Sykes was during the prefer plague era and all these things, yeah. like with suicide season, he was like the, everybody was looking up to him. You need yep. that. So like when- And it's Will Ramos now who, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, credit to the rest of the band they're all amazing and everything but 
you know, his addition to Lorna Shore, I think, is like almost completely responsible for like the Deathcore revival and Alex Terrible. But I think especially, you know, Will Ramos is responsible for the resurgence now more than anything else, in my opinion. Yeah, he definitely has the even if you take a look at I don't know if you look at his personal YouTube channel, but even there is doing well, like he's doing reviews and stuff and it's working. Like when you have the personality, like I keep, I think I said it in a few videos I'm doing, but like personality is a big factor. You can be amazing on a stage if you don't have the personality to to back it up. The likability is another thing. Like there's two sides of it. There's people who <laughs> would hate like Limp Biscuit or whatever and yeah. Attila and all that. But you yeah. you also have, you know, on the other side, like some somebody like Will, who you instantly like the guy. He's pretty tough. To hate, like I'm sure he has haters, but like he's likable, he's fun. So I, I, I feel like a scene always needs that, like to, to thrive. So there you go. Sorry, dumb. I just want to. Oh, you're 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 you're, you're good, man. You're good. <laughs> I, I'd I'd love to because you you say you said not working in the music industry, but ultimately when you started working and, and doing stuff with Creative Live, you were bringing in a lot of people that uh, from from what I gather, you kind of already met or, or people you were, were meeting yeah. through production and stuff like that. So yeah. um, I'd love for you to maybe talk to us about, I mean, specifically, we've had Cam on, uh, Cam Argon okay. on, uh, yeah. on the show before. And uh, when I was looking up some of some of his stuff on like Cam every day, actually, I think I have hmm. it here. I had. I like uh, this guy. He's amazing. The best one is mom caught, caught mom petting Susan weird. That's the best one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, hey, that's me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's you in an old ass video, and and yeah. when he was starting to do Creative Live and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of like weird, like looking through like what Creative Live was doing. You know, you were kind of spearheading a new branch because it was all kind of yep. just photo and video, and then all yep. all of a sudden there were metal production. That, that was starting to go on every now yep. and then you were like hosting these uh these interviews and these panels with with guests and stuff i'd love for you to maybe talk about how that experience was maybe uh, maybe like were you bringing in people that you already knew and if so how did you already know them or mm-hmm. was that uh people you met through doing that so for anybody who doesn't know creative live uh was i guess still is they got acquired by fiverr a couple years ago but creative live uh was a uh online education company for creative people uh the roots of the company started out in the photography space because the founder who i've known for like 20 years a guy named chase jarvis is like a really no really well-known photographer and so he started essentially what happened is like people photographers were doing all these like weekend workshop type things all over the place where you'd pay like two thousand dollars or whatever to go to this three-day workshop where they would teach you whatever photography thing and chase of course you know was super well networked in the photo world and they said well how about in and live streaming at the time was a new thing this was like 2011 i think they started doing it and they said well how about instead of doing this workshop to eight people who paid fifteen hundred dollars to be here why don't we live stream it to you know, thousands of people. And then, you know, we can sell it to them for $150, the recording of it, if they like it. And so they did that and it took off. And then uh, they raised their series A. I think they raised like 8 million or something like that for the series A, which was right around when I came on. Then we raised the series B, which was like 25 million or something like that. And so as part of that, um, they wanted to expand into other things uh, aside from photography. And uh, I met, I overheard uh, Craig, the sort of co-CEO at the time, mention, you know, well, we should do music. And I was like, oh, well, I, and I've known Craig for a long time too. And uh, I was like, well, I could help with that just because I knew, you know, you see a picture of me and Al Levy here. I knew Al and some other producers and stuff. And he was like, okay, well, let's do it. Um, and because the company was still really early and kind of scrappy at the time, they basically just let me, you know, give it a shot. And it ended up, I think they were all skeptical because they're like metal. Like, I don't know about that, but I knew. Yeah. It's like a hard pivot, I, right? It's like fairly, it's like pretty different from what you'd expect. It, yeah. it is. But as we all know, you know, metal doesn't sell a lot of albums necessarily, but it's huge in the gear space. Like if you go to yeah. Guitar Center or Nam or something like that, probably half the stuff there is metal related. Um, and so I knew that there was potential here and it ended up like being a relatively successful business, a lot smaller than the photography. But, you know, uh, I think I think in the first year and a half or something that I was doing those courses for Creative Live, I think we did like a million and a half dollars in revenue or something, which is not a huge amount of money by Silicon Valley standards, but it was enough. It was legit. 
um, enough enough for them to be like, okay, there's something here. So as far as how I got those people on, so Al was the first person I had on because I've been friends with him for years. And yeah. uh, our friend Bill from Tune Track helped us out with that too. Also known him for years. He um, had a, a ton of connects, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of them know lots of people. And, and I knew some other people. So it was basically just people that I knew were friends of friends and stuff. Lots of people that I had crossed paths with years ago, but, you know, like Ben from Dillinger and Kurt from Converge, Tommy from Between the Buried Me, the periphery guys I get introduced to via uh, Bill from Toon Track. And, you know, it's it, it people that either I knew or were friends of friends. So it was not very hard to get them to say yes to something, because especially at the time, that was like a really cool you know, a really cool new thing, you know, yeah. this kind of live stream format and stuff. And uh, so I did that for a couple of years and um, I, I'm, I'm really proud of that because I think that really changed the way that people learn how to produce music because I mean, these reached like thousands and thousands, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people. And before we did that, there was no way to have access to that kind of information unless you like worked at a studio or knew somebody who did or whatever, like you couldn't, Nobody would show you how they did this stuff. And we were the first to do that. So I'm really proud of that. And the stuff I do now with URM Academy, I think is cooler because yeah. you get the multi-tracks and, you know, we've just taken it further. So I think what we're doing now is cooler. But what we did at Creative Live, you know, that was me and Ale. We're the first people to do this shit, like mm -hmm. literally the first. Him and I did the first one in, t in September. I think it was September of, tw no, it was in 2013. Maybe it was, maybe it was September of 2013, whatever. Yeah. We did the shit over 10 years ago. Yeah. Um. And we've been doing this literally longer than anybody, like live streaming, like education on music production. And uh, I, I think it's really changed the way that people make music. We've reached so many people. Like, I, I genuinely think that we, maybe I'm being arrogant, but I really think that we have somewhat of a role to play in how many people now are making cool metal music in their bedroom, you know, on a simple like studio and stuff. I, I know that we played a role in that. I don't I think it's like right, right, at, right at the cusp of like all these, uh, these plugins and, and yep. all this new gear, like the axe effects and campers and all this yep. stuff. Like it yep. was kind of like the, the, the bedroom musician, if you want to yep. call it was pretty much starting at that same point as well. So I'm sure a yep. lot of people were, were tuning in just, just for that. Right. It was, it was new to everyone. There was no other info, even, even text base, you know, you had no, a few nothing. forums, but that's it. So to have it in video form is, is something else. Right. I think it was ahead of its time. Well, it's not, I think like, it's a fact, like it was ahead of its time like just the live streaming thing it wasn't really if you go back to those years it wasn't big like now you say live no, streaming people nobody were, did it but now it's a thing in 2013 nobody was live streaming at all at all like people were not even thinking about you know no. about really doing it especially not for for a living so i think it was a proof of concept and it's awesome that um, it became more accessible to it. And I'm sure it helped a lot of projects getting kickstarted and things maybe you don't even know. I'm sure there's like successful, maybe people in bands, stuff like that, that, you know, for sure there are learn through it. So like, it's, I mean, it's a big thing. I'll give one example of this is like at URM Academy, you know, uh, Buster Odohom, like he was a mm -hmm. member of URM, like way back in the day. I, I don't know if it was like how he learned everything, but he, like, we definitely are part of, you know, how he learned to produce and stuff. And now he's probably Top like the most tier, influential. Like most, yeah. yeah. That's probably it. the most influential person in modern metal right now. And I'm not taking credit for anything he's done, but I'm just saying that he was part of our community from, you know, years and years and years ago. And it's just really cool now to see people like him have so much impact. No, but I, I think people are super quick to be defensive, saying like, oh, my God, ego, whatever. But I also think it's important to acknowledge when we do good stuff that helps or whatever, to be able to be like, yeah, I think I played a part. It's just positive. Like I, I have like we, yeah. we both share this mindset of like, let's encourage people to be proud of themselves and be happy with what they're they're doing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that and and it's a good thing you and you, you're still doing it today i see now mm -hmm. i think you're offering also a program for youtubers and stuff like that like who wants to learn and stuff like i could be wrong i think i saw yeah, you yeah. mentorship and stuff like you like people don't know the difference it can make and the amount of time you're saving through those you know mistakes and totally it, it can like some mistakes can be very uh you know hurtful to your brand so like if you can learn prior to that and 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 be ahead it's 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 a big so i'm I, I, any of these things like music production or youtube 
the beginning of it is brutal because you have no idea what you're doing yeah. and it's so hard. Both of those things are really hard. Music yeah. production and YouTube are hard. Yeah. And in the beginning, it's just you feel like you're pushing this giant rock up a hill and it's not moving mm, at all. Yeah. And, you know, why would and, and if and if you can pay somebody or a company to give you a little bit of help and speed up that part of the process where it sucks. I think that's money well spent because uh, that part is not fun and you want to get through it as soon as possible. Yeah. And it's very like, that's, that's something that, that sometimes people don't know, but like, it's very valuable. Like when we're talking about years of knowledge, like years of like mistakes of play and, and, and you're offering it like that, there's a big value because as you said it's it is brutal to do something and and you feel vulnerable to you have no idea like you're putting yourself out there and as we all know the internet is not always not kind. kind yeah so it's like you never really know so i feel like it's it, it's a I, i'm pointing it out because it feels like it's a big part of your personality to try to give back and use those tools and i feel like that what you did with music was also that like it was part of that i think it's awesome personally not to fanboy too Thank much you. i think everybody everybody knows i keep <laughs> i keep saying but I, it's important to say those things too so yeah and and i want to be clear you know urm i didn't start urm that's uh al and joey and joel so mm -hmm. i i came along a little bit after that so i want to give credit for that yeah. to them um but uh you know i've been uh, a big part of it since then it's awesome it's really cool I wanted to add to that because, uh, and you, and by the way, what we were, before I forget, you mentioned, uh, people in the attack attack and stuff like that. I didn't know what Bill Murray was until people in her chat told me. And it was like, <laughs> you know, it's Johnny. I'm now I'm a, honestly, I'm a big fan of what it, it's so sick and, and weird and different. I just wanted to give a big shout out while we're here. It's, it's awesome. Oh, he's brilliant. Amazing. Like no one, like, I think it's fair to say that, like, it's unique. Like no one is doing that at all just wanted to yeah. put it out there so oh okay you, uh oh, me and franz say, despite what i'm wearing i am about that life is uh, uh -huh. something, something, something that was fat back said. then <laughs> i mean i mean Please take that off i don't want to look at that <laughs> <laughs> but fair, it, fair. it's gone but, it's gone but it's different because if we take a look at the picture that you were wearing your suicide uh, silent shirt you literally yeah. look like you were working out quite a lot like it could be wrong but no i was i was bigger then yeah looked like you were you know anyway, um, I, the, the 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 point wasn't to to bring out uh, no, no, we, we know what we're <laughs> doing was, I, I know <laughs> I, you know what you're doing like he, no he, but i, I you, he, you said you said i i actually I, I would love to hear you talk on attila that that's like cause yeah. I, I saw that and i thought the the conversation w w was cool but um i think there's you know we were talking earlier about uh, you know, having having these like, iconic people that are yeah. you know these these front men that are uh, charismatic and all this stuff and and you know I think Franz is charismatic for sure without a doubt yeah. as well but it, but yeah. it's a different type of uh, charisma right uh, what, what do you what are your thoughts on Attila and what they've done over the years Oh I th I legitimately think about that life is one of the best metal albums ever made like in all seriousness I absolutely love it um, I think the songwriting is amazing. Uh, I think it's hilarious, but like legitimately, like really catchy and good. Um, Franz's vocal performance is awesome. I think it's one of Joey's best mixes. I punish him yeah. about it all the time. Um, <laughs> the, the bass tone, the bass tone on that album is so fucking aggressive. And uh, like, if you listen to that, the bass is louder than the guitar. And I think that's a big part of what makes that mix so good. Uh, I think that album is fucking fantastic. Yeah, I think, and I, and I think, um, you know, like to, to make a connection, not to talk only about YouTube, sorry, done, because of course I'm going to go there a little bit, but like, it's, it's like, I, I feel like Franz just knows what, what he's doing. He yeah. knows what he's doing. Like he, like people, when people react, it, it's always funny to me because they're trying to hate and like runes or whatever, but like you're, they're always helping, right? That's what he wants that's what he wanted and Tension. he always wanted it and it works so like he's just gonna keep doing it and i feel like about that life was the prime of that like yep. you filmed the video yeah. big key how do you call that like big necklace like gangster yep. like that he knew how it would be perceived by by metal but next thing you know millions of views sells everything works so i he, he's a he's a good businessman like i think he's 
always been uh, yeah. with Attila w would be what I what I think. So, and and you guys talked about it during your, you know, you had you had him a few times already. I've had him on my podcast yeah. too yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've been on the Attila program <laughs> since. Uh, I mean, I I remember the first thing I heard by them that I really liked was um, I think it was off of Rage. I think. Um, which was like 2011 or something like that. that. That was when they were like getting good like that. That song Soda yeah. in the Water Cup that was like good. Um, and uh, Party with the Devil, I think, was like the song I liked the best. And I was like, OK, this is good. Um, like they were not that good in the very beginning. And then they got good around Rage. And then they got really, 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 really good on About That Life. Yeah. I think it would be fair. Honed it in. Yeah. 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 I mean, everything, everything about the band, right? Like, uh, sure, the music got better as well. Uh, Franz got better. Uh, uh, like, yeah. by, He's by fucking long great. Shot. He's like, he yeah. does not get enough credit. He's a fucking extremely good vocalist. Yes. Yeah. People, uh, people are quick to, to, to ignore the talent because of their opinion about him. But, you know, I think it's, it's kind of undeniable the talent that, that the yeah. dude has. And, and then, and then to your point, the production on about that life is, is is way better than it was on Rage, and on Rage it was ba way better than than yep. the, well, way way better than than the self titled or whatever yep. the album was before that. So it's it's always been cool to see where um, where Attila's bringing music next, and every single album kind of does something different, even even to this day. So I mean, I think it's been cool to see anybody around the MySpace era needs to be grateful for Joey, honestly, for <laughs> real. Like yeah, absolutely, he's you, you. I cannot talk about MySpace era without thinking about joey like he was part of it it's also in milk or like miss may i all those bands like he was on every album that, that would get out you're like okay that's probably that's probably joey right I here mean, i something. think joey is one of the most important people in the history of metal i mean he yeah. totally changed the way that metal sounds especially you know metalcore because before that metalcore sounded shitty True. You know, other than there's a few exceptions, you know, like Kill Switch and stuff sounded good. All the like stuff that yeah. Andy Sneap, you know, did and stuff. But those other were the than huge that, huge bands, right? Yeah. Other like other than like that, top of the line. Yeah, kinda, yeah. Yeah. They sounded good. And Bring the Horizon, obviously, again, because they were going to people like Frederick Nordstrom and Henrik yeah. Ude and stuff. But other than like the tippy top of the genre, all the smaller stuff sounded like shit until Joey came along. And basically because Joey is you know, this like bizarre genius that doesn't think about music the way anybody else does figured out a way to just make literally anybody sound amazing because he would just do whatever it takes to make it sound perfect. And it did. And it was fucking, you know, he would take anybody and make them sound incredible. And it just sort of proved that this kind of music could sound better than anybody thought it could. I think I think he yep. he he helped create a sound as well, yeah. right? Like there was there was something to I think everything he touched kind of had the Joey even from I, I think he he seemed to be very hands on as well with with you know songwriting and 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 yep. these things and so I think that makes a big difference too. I think a lot of a lot of metal at a smaller scale at least uh, producing isn't necessarily something that is like very sought after or people don't think about like having an external uh, opinion no. and, and someone actually working on your songs with you. And I think, I think metalcore didn't really have much of that. Um, and I think Joey maybe hit kind of the, like an intermediate level. Like he, he wasn't charging millions for the types of right. mixes he was right. doing in the beginning as well. Either. I mean, there was no, it was like these tiny little bands that yeah. didn't have a lot of money. Yeah, and he made them sound like the biggest fucking yeah. bands ever, right? So it was, yep. it was like, it was kind of a no brainer for bands to, to go with them at that and point. And you could like hear him get better too, because like yeah. if you listen to, you know, say Attack Attack or Asking Alexandria's first album, like at the time they sounded amazing. If you listen to it now, it's a little bit like rough around the edges. But then just, uh, you know, in the next couple years, like I would say, you know, Speaker of the Dead at the, I think that was the best sounding like metalcore album for, or deathcore, whatever you want to call it, like for mm -hmm. a long time. I think Speaker of the Dead was like the gold standard, which yeah. he did. Um, and then uh, the Attack Attacks self-titled, I think still to this day, sounds fucking amazing. Oh. I think that's some of his best work. Um, and then About That Life, like he, you could just hear Joey level up like album yeah. after album after album, because one of the reasons why is because, and for anybody who doesn't know, like I'm, you know, Joey's one of my business partners. So I yeah. had a million <laughs> conversations with him about this stuff. So I know, I know all this stuff. Um, 
because he would use like the same plugins on every session, he was like getting better and better and better at using those tools all the time. Mm -hmm. And so like these guitar tones, he would like get 1% better every time. And, you know, mm -hmm. he's doing so many fucking albums that, you know, he, over the course of two years, he probably did like 20 albums or something like that. He was and just got better. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. He was not taking breaks. He had no, no. life for sure. For no. sure. No. And he just like perfected that shit yeah. in a way that no, he just did the stuff that other people weren't willing to do because it fucking sucks. Like, like, like the level of precision that he would do on those, like, I don't know. I want to, I don't want to bore people with the details, but you know, uh, with like Drumagog, like manually choosing which snare hit out of the round Robin from Drumagog is like a level of just like obsession that nobody is willing to do, but that's what it took to make it sound exactly right. It's like, no, I don't want one of those eight randomly chosen snare hits. I want number four. This one. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. No, but like for, for Ben, it's very valuable because they would get there and they would fully trust the guy, like a hundred percent, like you're not even yeah. doubting. Like I, I would be in a band, I would go there and I would just listen. If he would tell me like, I would never argue. I would be like, yeah, let's, let's go. So there, that he was in every studio update. I don't know if you guys remember that every band would go in studio and record like an update. He was in every, every yeah. single update. Like you could see Joe, like, I think he was smoking, <laughs> smoking and, yeah, yes. and just like and just like enjoying things. So like he was literally a part. Like these guys usually are behind the scenes. You don't really know. He was up front. Everybody knew. Yeah. Like I was 15, and my dream was to record with with Joey. So like it tells you how impactful you know he was as. I'm pretty person. sure he was also, if not the very first, he was one of the very first people to sell drum samples. Mm, he was um, super early on, for sure. Yeah, he, yeah. he did Joey Sturgis drums in, what, 2011 or some shit? Or I don't remember when it was, but very, very, very early. When people like him and like Cameron from Chango were like pretty much the two first. And I think Joey might have been first. So even beyond like his productions, like the fact that, you know, he would sell his pod farm presets and drum samples and stuff like that, you know, I think helped create this like home studio movement the the way that it is i remember um before i knew him i remember uh, i uh when i was just learning how to record i remember going in the andy sneep forum and he you know everyone wanted joey's like pod farm sound because it sounded so fucking amazing mm -hmm. and he was like well here's the patch you guys can have it if you want but i'm warning you it's not going to sound good and i was like oh come on like he's just being <laughs> modest and i downloaded it, it just sounded like shit yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's when i realized <laughs> That's when I realized, like, oh, the magic yeah. ingredient here isn't Pod Farm; it's Joey. It's Joey, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was super fucking active and and giving back in the forums way, way back. I I remember even I wasn't even a part of these forums, and people would talk about him being part of the forums back yep. in the day, and when talking about plugins and stuff like that. So, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Let's uh let let's talk a bit about we, we've we've talked about the past let's let's move on to to maybe today i sure we already kind of talked about um some of the newer like bigger bands that are doing deathcore right now but have you been have you been seeing any of the the recent revival as much as it comes from, from like uh bands from the myspace days coming back like we've been talking about jerome from the very beginning but Jer jerome are, are making a comeback right now Um, but we've got bands like All Shall Perish and With Blood Comes Cleansing and stuff like that that are all, uh, you know, playing shows and putting out new music and stuff. What are you, uh, are, are you stoked on that sort of thing? Or it's like a thing of the past or have you, have you noticed the wave? Um, I'm not, I, I, I'm not speaking about any of those bands in particular, but mm -hmm. in general, I think when those older bands come back, it's not the same because I mean, you know, now they're 35 or whatever and nothing against like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, they, they, it's impossible to recapture that kind of like youthful naivete. You just can't because you're an mm -hmm. adult now. And like a big part of what made those bands great is that they were just like dumb little kids that had no idea what they were doing. And there's no way to go back to that. So I don't like, it's generally not that interesting to me when old bands come back. 
Um, I do think it's interesting, like some of those bands like Tracheotomy and uh, what's Tactosa, and there's a couple yeah. others that are kind of and doing got, that, like. like like Psycho Dead frame. and Psycho Frame yep. and Slam Waste. There's like a the, the, but that that to me is super fucking interesting. That new wave of yeah. really young kids. Like yeah, Tracheotomy the, is my favorite of them, and they look yeah. like they're like 17 or something yeah. like that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how old they are, but they look really young, and I think they're awesome. Oh, I, I like yeah. that a lot. I don't know if you would consider this to be deathcore or not, but a lot of these bands like uh, Gaijin and. There's a band called like Slime NW from Portland. They're kind of doing something similar to that. Like a lot of these sort of like half beat down, half like deathcore kind of bands. I really like a lot of that stuff. It sounds really nasty. And then, you know, again, there's a lot, there's some of this other stuff that's kind of on the border of slam and deathcore, like peeling flesh. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. They'd probably, they'd probably be mad to hear, to hear me say that they're deathcore ish, but <laughs> you know, whatever to me, it's, it, it's not actual slam because actual slam people are like alcoholic you know, domestic abusers. Like <laughs> these are not like actual scumbags. So, uh, yeah, there's yeah, agreed sure. probably up until alcoholic, but yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, but like, but peeling flesh, like if you like, I'm, I'm watching a lot, you know, Garza podcast stuff, like I like super chill, like smoke, like uh, stoner. Old bit, body like, box just... is another one I like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah body box. Yeah. They're, they're a new song fucking rips. But yeah. I, I have to agree with you, though. I think it's much more interesting. Of course, I'm always happy when you see a, a, back, a band coming back. It's always cool. But, like, it's even cooler to see, like, younger people yeah. just, you know, giving a new touch to it, like a different approach. So it, it's like it's it's new and it has nostalgia. It's very, very special. But I think I there's agree. like there's like a um, there was a perspective there that's different too. like we see a lot of these bands doing like specifically the MySpace era yes. stuff and and pulling what they enjoy out of that. And a lot of that sound just does not exist anymore. So we talk about the hardcore elements in, in, in deathcore, but also like the brutal death elements. There's a lot yep. of that in a lot of these bands that like no one incorporates that. Like no one sounds like the cleansing in 2020 yeah. in 2024 out of, out of the bigger bands but these new kids are, are bringing some of that stuff back and to your point i think the the youthful energy that you were talking about is present in these bands right and just kind of doing their own thing and their own spin on it and i don't know i think i think it's super cool to it's it's super exciting i would have never thought like this is mind blowing to me that 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 there's a this much interest in deathcore in 2024 yeah. in general, but that specifically that sort of MySpace sound is like making a comeback as well. Like it's not fucking huge, but it's still like there are a lot of eyes on that sort of thing, and a lot mm -hmm. of the younger folks that are that are into it. So I don't know, man. It's it's I find it cool when when me and Yan started doing this podcast thing and and him doing videos and stuff. We thought we would only be surrounded by thirty plus year olds. <laughs> we did not expect to have fifteen year olds in the Discord and 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 he, in these chats and stuff like that. But there's a there's a a pretty significant amount of those. So it's cool. It's cool to see. In in my opinion, yeah, I love it. Yeah, and it's it's like I w I wasn't expecting that at all on my channel. Like in my mind, I was like, okay, so people who were there back in the days who feel a bit nostalgic are gonna are gonna be there. And then I see all these comments saying like, hey, thanks for you know talking about Winds of Plague. I didn't know this band. I'm like, oh my god, okay, there's younger people actually yeah. interested in the history of the you know they're fairly young video uh, long videos I do, I do have to give a shout out to winds of plague because i feel like that's a band that was very ahead of their time which i've also yep. been on the winds of plague, winds of plague program for a long time uh I, I feel like they don't get the credit they deserve true um probably because they just sort of went inactive probably you yeah. know at a time a where times. yeah if you they, you know i mean they have other things going on in their lives i don't mm -hmm. you know i don't think they really care that much but um yeah, I mean, that stuff, especially like uh, Decimate the Week, you know, and the Great Stone War, you know, if those came out today, I feel like they'd be more popular than they were at the time. They're very ahead of the curve. It's what the kids yep. are craving right now, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and to to and to be fair, too, I think it's like the orchestral stuff that, that we hear a lot in, in more recent deathcore and yeah. like modern deathcore. They were doing that, but they were doing it right. It's, it's yeah. not, it's not just choirs. It's not like there's a, it's more cinematic. There's more of yeah. a, I think it's more nuanced than a lot of what we hear uh, today. No shade towards the, the, the more recent bands, but I think to, to your point, they were way, way ahead of the oh, yeah. of uh, doing that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, they started doing that in what, 2005 or something. Yep. So almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah.
Yeah, I think as as you said, I think people were just not ready for that yet or whatever. Like no. they, they were fairly big in the scene, but not as big as it could have been, I think. And I, I kept saying that like and I think you, you commented on on the video like this needed to be made. But like I've I've realized like when I did the Winds of Plague video, a lot of people wrote a message saying thanks for finally giving that then, you know, credit and 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 stuff like that so it's it's funny how timing is everything like if we talk about lorna and to the hellfire or slaughter to prevail with demolisher and all all these moments that you need to make it to the next level like it's it's yep. it takes like just the perfect timing you can you need do a the, hit song you yeah. need the right front man and you need to be just at sort of the right moment in time yeah exactly you can have everything right but if people are not ready for it, yep, you, you miss it. So yeah, I think it's interesting. All right, man. Well, uh, yeah, I think I think we're gonna we're gonna. It's eight o'clock here. Yeah, so we're uh, we're gonna end it here. But I wanna I wanna thank you so much again, Finn, for for taking the time and uh, going down memory lane a little bit with us and uh, and doing this with us. It was really cool. Uh, really cool to chat with you, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, dude. It was it was amazing. I also want to again say thank you for like I know I I told you like fifty times in messages, but it's not the same time like that. But like, thank you very much for that. And um, we wanted to have you here to talk about. I've watched I think every single interview you you've been in, and it's it's a lot about YouTube. And of course, I have question about YouTube, but like exploring deathcore and this scene with you was like you know or. It was the goal, and and it's awesome to get your perspective and your. It was amazing, so I, I'm really grateful for that. Thank you for oh, everybody. Go listen to the Whitechapel demo after this. Exactly, that's yes, your homework. Sir. Yes, sir. yes, <laughs> you have to. I don't know if uh, I don't know if you want to plug any uh, any of your oh, stuff yeah. uh, before we head. I've got a command ready even in, in chat for uh, for some of your links, but if you want to maybe tell people what you've got going on or uh, or any shout outs you want to do. Uh, I don't know. Just if you want to hear me talk about music more, you can just look up my name on YouTube. Uh, if you want to talk, if you want to hear me talk about YouTube, look me up on LinkedIn. That's there we great. Go. That's all great. right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Finn. And we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, take care. Man. Thanks. All right, take care.